Hi, it's Mystery Dumpster Teardown time again, and this one uh, comes from the archives in the bunker. I've actually got two of these down here. What is it? It's Hewlett Packard, none of that Agilent or Keysight rubbish. Uh, 3488A switch control unit. Yes, it does look uh, a lot like it basically uses the same case as a lot of the, uh, you know, the 3450, uh, uh, what is it? Not the 3458, the other variant that I've done a video on. Anyway, they're multimeters. Um, they're old school multimeters and stuff like that. But this is a, a basically a relay switching slash control unit. So the idea is that you like have these in um, large complex test systems or uh, you know some other control system that you need to basically switch things um, either uh, switch channels for measurement into multimeters and things like that or you need to uh, you know control various uh, stuff and so it'll have like relay cards it'll have like um, you know basically multiplexer cards and things like that and you can plug in uh, different options into these things and you can see that this one uh, you can have like looks like um, so well this one is the base unit down here which has the GPIB interface which is how it's all controlled none of that uh, serial port rubbish all old school HPIB and uh, looks like it has five different slots and these these ones are marks uh, marked mux 2 and 3 and uh, unit 1 don't know what that yeah it's it's the same is it I assume yeah a mux um, interface card, but you can get like various, you know, different cards for it. I won't go through it. Anyway, uh, this sticker here is interesting. <laughs> I, I got a story about this. Uh, property of Silverbrook Research Proprietary Limited. Now, I, uh, Silverbrook is a legendary, you know, infamous company here in Australia. It's a, like a research kind of a research think tanky kind of thing run by a guy named C or was run by a guy named Kia Silverbrook and I don't know if he still is but technically he was um, at one point the world's largest or equal yeah I think he surpassed the world's largest holder of patents right so this guy was obsessed with getting patents so this think uh, tank they would have actually an army of in-house patent attorneys who would uh, like take one of Kia's you know ideas and then patent like literally a hundred different ways to implement it um, and they were just churning out and I believe he got like thousands of patents to his name absolutely crazy he was obsessed with passing you know Edison and you know all those sorts of things anyway uh, they their main technology was actually this high-speed uh, not kind of inkjet. I can't remember it. Uh, mem memjet. Oh, anyway, it was some sort of printing, high-speed printing, uh, you know, technology. It was like this printing head, and they just patented like a thousand different ways to do it or something. And uh, you know, it, they had like prototypes, and they were actually producing stuff in house and things like that. And um, but it never really went anywhere. I think it got bought out by somebody in the end, who in the end uh, decided that no, we own all the patents. I think that maybe. Maybe there was some lawsuit or legal uh, quibbles over who owns the patents, but I believe uh, Kia eventually lost all his patents. So I think it was, yes, yeah, signed over to the investors or something like that. And the company's like gone. Uh, I don't know if they're gone bust now, but they might have been absorbed into something else. And they never actually produced this miracle 3D uh, printing technology, high-speed printing technology. I can't remember the exact details. But anyway, I went for a job there once. Um, this was a long time ago, probably 15 years ago or something now, because I've been doing the EV blog like for full-time for a decade now and doing it for 12 years. It was before the blog, before I went to uh, Altium. I believe, yeah, yeah, it was before I went to Altium. Anyway, so it was at least four years, yeah, so it's got to be at least 15 years ago now. Uh, went for a job in over here at Silverbrook Research, and they were like really, uh, you know, they were, they were top, top guys there working on right, like really, uh, you know, really innovative uh, type stuff. And I can't remember what the job was for. It was, you know, a design engineer, you know, doing something or other. And uh, and the, so I went in for a couple of interviews with the technical uh, team and they like really liked me. They really wanted me and, you know, it was a it was a done thing. But I had to pass a third interview hurdle, which was uh, to meet with 
uh, Kia Silverbrook's right hand man. So everyone who got hired at this company, like they famously like hired like every PhD graduate and, you know, so anyone like, you know, masters and PhD, like minimum to, I don't have a masters or PhD, but you know, I was just being hired as a general design engineer, but they sucked up all of the, uh, like, uh, you know, highly qualified researchers in the country, in the country, in various uh, fields. And anyway, so everyone apparently who was hired at the company had to be vetted by Kia's right hand man. So anyway, I went in for the, because the company, by the way, was, I believe, like famously a, like a, a flat uh, tier, horizontal tier company that was Kia Silverbrook, and everyone else, and it was like, it sounds like Altium, you know, all, all, all decisions go through, you know, the head honcho, anyway, um, so yeah, I was, uh, I was interviewed by him, and he was very strange, don't know, can't remember, call names or anything, but anyway, very strange individual, so, so the technical guys are in the meeting as well, and they're asking me some technical questions, and this guy, you know, he's looking at my resume, and, you know, like, what's all this, stuff about publishing things and I go oh yeah yeah you know I've published like because everyone likes it when you publish stuff and anyway so he uh went oh, what's this deal with publishing and I went you know and, and he kind of like shook his head like uh -uh, this is bad this is not good you you publish things because they were remember this was a super secretive company apparently they uh like hid how much like milk and consumables they buy, lest anyone try and figure their competitors, whoever they were, tried to figure out how much funding they have based on the headcount and stuff like that. So everything was like super secret. How many people they hired, all that sort of stuff was like super secret. They, they had hundreds of people working for them. Um, but anyway, so they were really paranoid about secrecy. So they, he saw that I had published stuff and he's like shaking his head and I'm kind of going, okay, is that a problem? And he's, you know, nodding and going, uh, yeah. And I go, well, what's, you know, obviously I wouldn't publish about stuff about what the company's doing and things like that. And he's sorry about the static shot here. This is boring. But anyway, tell the story. And he uh, like and, and it eventually got to a point where we started like I started going, well, what would be acceptable uh, you know, for me to, like, do I have to stop publishing things? And he's, he's going, like, he's nodding, and I'm going, well, what if I wrote a book about gardening or a blog, or if I started a gardening blog, would that be a problem? And, you know, I just, like, picked a, like, it's, it's totally non-random thing. I'm not a gardener. Just picked a totally, you know, thing out of left field, and he went, yep, that'd be a problem. And I went, Why? It's too, and he just wouldn't answer, like really strange. Um, and so I'm like at this point going, yeah, this car, I don't think I want to work for this company. Um, so yeah, and the, and the technical people, you could see that like <laughs> they're in the meeting as well and they're just like, like their heads are going low and they're face palming there. And <laughs> so I could read their minds. It's like, oh, not this again kind of thing. Anyway, anyway, so I didn't get the job. I got I got uh, shit canned by the um, yeah, Kia Silverbrook's right hand man. So even though all the technical team wanted me. So there you go. I almost got into Silverbrook research. And I know many people have almost gotten into Silverbrook <laughs> research for similar reasons. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, yeah, anyway, calibration certificate, quite old. Let's have a look inside this thing, shall we? Wow, these have some very sexy long screws in them. Check this out. Yes, I'm using this bad boy because, wow, look at the size of these, isn't it? Just for kicks. Anyway, oh, that one's loosey-goosey. Boss, someone, somebody forgot to tighten that one up. Because there are no screws on the side. Well, there we have it. It's uh, very modular. There's a huge power brick down here. Look at that thing. Um, that's like, you know, an off-the-shelf power brick. How do we... Oh, yeah. There we go. That's the uh, rear interface contact. So it's just a card edge thing. And they're all... There's like a... There's just like screw... Probably just like screw terminal blocks in there. Oh, no. There you go. What are those? Uh, they're not... Do you just push them in? Can we just... Pull those out? Are they? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the deal is there. Do you need a special tool to? Oh no, there we go. No, the screw <laughs> screws in the top there. Dull. So these modules just 
will slide out like that. Ta-da! And they just got shielding plates, top and bottom. You can see the relays in there. We'll take a look at those. They're probably like NECs, Fujis, something like that. Oh, it just links there. <laughs> There's not much in there. Yeah, there's uh, driver trannies down there. You can see those. Well, I'll whip the top off in a minute. Oh, there we go. Look at that. None of that solder mask rubbish. Wow. Is that like just... Yeah, that's just like gold plate without solder mask. Ooh, sexy. Wow, I'm going to get a nice photo of that. That's beautiful. Oh, and they've done the same over here for the LCD as well. A couple of chip on board things with just the gold plate um, <laughs> traces, <laughs> gold flash. Absolutely brilliant. It's probably thick as too. And, uh, oh, I'm made in Morocco. Hi to all my Moroccan viewers. ST. I didn't know ST made power bricks, but there you go. There you go. It's got a couple of control lines and uh, looks like a plus S, minus S, VO, <laughs> whatever. Some discrete stuff over there, and uh, there's our main switch. It's uh, it actually just runs cable from the front, and then it's you know it, it's all over the shop. The mains connector is actually on the back of this module here, like this, and then that runs the cable along the side to the power switch over here, and then it's going to run all the way along here over here, all the way over to the power transformer. On this side, it's like, ah, oh, it's, no, the layout's just all wrong. Um, nope, 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 nope. Anyway, got a big ass uh, reservoir cap and just a, probably a 7805 or something down there. That's a uh, bridge rectifier, goes straight in the mains cap and that's all she wrote. So basic full wave rectifier coming from, you know, it doesn't need much. It's just got to drive the relays and things like that. Not a, And the processor, of course, not a huge uh, requirement. Just the other side of that back plane there. Look at this. USA made. USA. USA. If anyone has any clue what those characters are under the HBIB connector there, please leave it in the comments. Because oh, what the? And you have to actually unscrew the top cover. This board doesn't actually come out as a module. And all the 6800 or 6809, sorry, 6809 fanboys go wild. There you go. Um... And what else have we got? That's our uh, GPIB in it. That'd be our GPIB chip, would it? Yep. And the other 6800 support chips, of course. And uh, what have we got? Some memory down there. Just some, yep, interface stuff, glue logic. We've got a ROM. And, you know, not a huge amount more. It's just a processor. That's it. And then there's a mains input up there. I've got a uh, input filter, of course, but. That's about all she wrote. Looks like we have a posi drive fanboy at HP. Ugh, just Philips, please. And there's the relay board. Well, I was wrong on the relay brand, wasn't I? Um, and Aramat, uh, relay. Gee, like it rings a bell, but I, like, well, Japanese, of course, made in Japan, all the best stuff's made in Japan. Um, except, of course, USA, USA, USA. Um, so, yeah, like, we've just got, uh, 74 interface, uh, you know, a latch, uh, logic, so it's just, like, latching on a bus and stuff like that. As I said, uh, driver transistors up the top, and just some links for setting various configurations of the output, and it's just... Boring. Um, there's the wave indicator. It goes in this direction. They couldn't afford to put the extra um, bit on there to show that it's an arrow. So it's like, <laughs> come on. Anyway, um, and oh, look, they even went, we need a label here. But they didn't bother putting one. So that's all she wrote. Um, it's, you know, this is what you expect. It's like a 6809 processor driving a parallel backplane bus, which then latches into you know, the various five channel modules and address for whatever, you know, card you want to put into it. And that's it. It's just a max. Like, but I haven't actually looked at the configuration of these. Is this like a, a can you like switch onto a common bus and things like that? Let's actually take it out. Aha, common, yeah, look, 
So there's some common there. So uh, depending on the uh, MUX module, of course, um, you might have different uh, configurations. One might be, okay, you switch different inputs. This is what I'm used to in uh, test engineering, for example, is to have like a common bus and then you switch different things into it and then you go off the common bus. Well, you can't go into it because this doesn't do any measurement or anything. It's purely just uh, relay switching module. Anyway, the common bus would then go out onto some pins and then that common bus would then go into your, you know, your LCR meter or your voltmeter or whatever instrument that you're uh, measuring your stuff with. So there you have it, just a brief teardown of the HP 3488A switch control unit. Think of it as a multiplexer, uh, whatever. Um, I don't know about the different cards, but I'd be absolutely stunned if, uh, well, Keysight these days don't make a direct software equivalent to this thing, you know, complete command equivalent uh, to this thing. It wouldn't be in, of course, the old school HP uh, packaging like this. Might be in the, of course, it'll be in more modern, uh, you know, Keysight form factor. But I can guarantee you it'll be fully backward compatible because there's countless systems out there that uh, you know, are still running 20, 30 years later and they need to keep these things going and they don't want to rewrite their software. It's all still there and they want to replace their unit and they have to replace it with a software compatible unit. That's why the Keysight's latest multimeters, of course, all backward com software backward compatible, command backward compatible with all their old multimeters. That was one of their like really key goals. And so all their gear would still be software backward compatible with this, I'm sure. Anyway, that's it. Um, yeah, it's a box with a processor and a bunch of relays in it. Catch you next time. Oh, 14 segment LCD. Look at that. Oh, thing of beauty. Joy forever.